Channel 36, WTVQ-TV, Lexington. Good afternoon. Bob Hensley has tonight off. The Urban County Council today received a detailed report analyzing all aspects of streetlight expansion into those areas of the urban county which are currently without lights. Ken Betts has details. At work session this afternoon, the council received a streetlight report compiled by the Department of Public Works in response to a council request for information about the costs and revenues associated with the expansion of streetlights into those areas formerly under county jurisdiction. Public Works Commissioner Gordon Garner told the council that unless the system of funding the lights is revised, it will be difficult to install new lights. Garner recommended including the costs of lighting major roadways in the general fund while continuing to have the residential lighting paid for through the urban services taxes. Well, basically, we think that the street lights in, uh, the, on the major streets and in the downtown and other public areas, uh, they cost more to, to light those areas. You have more frequent lights and a higher level of illumination that everybody in the community uses those areas and benefits from the street lights and it should be what we call a general service rather than a full urban service. If it were just full urban, the only people who pay for the lights are the people on that particular street. We think everybody benefits from lighting major public areas and traffic uh, roads. The council approved this funding concept and in addition also approved two alternatives to the current method of installing street lights, allowing the city to proceed with street light plans. The first proposal calls for continued lighting of all new developments and expansion into sewer project areas on a program basis over the next six years. The other alternative will change the spacing of residential lighting from 200 feet to 300 feet, reducing the cost for new lights on residential streets about 30%. The council also gave tentative approval to a request from the Public Works Department for an additional dollar per ton dumping fee at the city's landfill, raising the cost from 450 to 550 a ton. Garner explains the reason for this increase. Just like everything else, inflation has pushed up the cost of operating the landfill. Uh, it's a service that's provided uh, uh, to industry and to others in the community. Uh, we need to increase revenues to be able to operate a first-class landfill, which we do have. Garner was also honored today by being selected as Young Engineer of the Year by the Kentucky Society of Professional Engineers. Reporting from City Hall, Ken Vance, 36 Eyewitness News. The controversial Sikorsky helicopter is still making headlines. The future of the $1.8 million helicopter was the major item on the agenda of an interim legislative committee which met today in Frankfurt. Eyewitness News reporter Tim Weldon has that story. The Sikorsky was put up for sale early this year, but just how close the state is to selling the aircraft seems to be anyone's guess at this point. In fact, a number of legislators are expressing a new confidence about the need for the helicopter, although they're critical of the manner in which Governor Brown obtained it. Several members of the subcommittee expressed the opinion that the legislature should have been involved in the decision to purchase the Sikorsky, and the future of the aircraft may still be decided in the General Assembly. If the governor decides to take the helicopter off the market, it will probably be up to the General Assembly to decide in the form of a budgetary package whether it's justified to keep the Sikorsky. National Guard Adjutant General Billy Wellman heads the Department of Military Affairs, which operates and maintains the Sikorsky. But I believe that Governor Brown has made publicly a statement that he was going to leave it up to the General Assembly as to where or not we keep the helicopter or he sells it. And I have not discussed this matter with the governor, but uh, I understand that this is a statement that uh, he has made. The subcommittee needs more information before making a recommendation to the full committee on state government. General Wellman was unable to give specific operating costs for the helicopter at this time, but is expected to have those figures for the subcommittee's December meeting. Tim Weldon, 36 Eyewitness News from Frankfurt. This is 36 Eyewitness News at 5. With Frank Faulkner and the weather, Mike Hartnett with sports, and from our anchor desk, Bob Hensley. A full-scale arson investigation is underway at Mount Sterling. Anita Ballard has this report on the half-million-dollar award-winning home of Al and Doran Nolan that burned early Sunday morning. As chairman of a local group opposing a 200,000-acre annex for Mount Sterling, Nolan says he has received no threats. 
However, he may have made enemies by opposing the controversial issue. It just happened that I was in the limelight during this period of time since I was chairman of the Annexation Opposition Committee, and I don't think there was any feelings that uh, uh, drastic that someone would try to burn your house and you up in it, you know. So. About a year ago, Nolan says another arson attempt was made. However, the gasoline bomb missed the house and exploded in the yard. Arson investigator for the state police, Don McBrayer, says a liquid accelerant, presently being analyzed for content identification, was poured under the house, around the doorways, and lit. Montgomery County Fire Chief Wayne Welch says the fire was visible from the road as 22 firemen rushed to the scene. Well, we had a fireball, is what it really meant to. It was burning underneath, in the attic, on the sides and everywhere. A $10,000 reward is being offered by Nolan for any information leading to the identification of the arsonist. Reporting from Mount Sterling, Anita Ballard, 36 Eyewitness News. Meanwhile, down in Lincoln County, state officials there are still probing the fire over the weekend in the community of McKinney. A preliminary investigation indicates the fire was the work of a tardy Halloween arsonist. Barry Peel reports. If this was somebody's idea of a Halloween prank, the people of McKinney and Lincoln County aren't laughing. It isn't very funny to them because this is just the latest in a series of incidents here that has turned Halloween from fantasy to fact. Residents of this town of 300 were on guard this Halloween, hoping to prevent another rash of Halloween arson that last year destroyed a rural church that sat in this lot and in a previous year a wooden bridge that stood on this site. This time, the arsonists averted detection by waiting two weeks before putting the torch to this old abandoned school. This time, the fire reached a dozen 55-gallon drums full of dangerous chemicals. 125 people in a quarter-mile area were evacuated for 10 hours because of the danger of toxic fumes. No, sir, it certainly isn't funny. It's not at all funny anymore. During the Halloween period for the last few years, uh, Barry, we've... Uh, We've seen damages done to bridges, other buildings. Uh, uh, we're very certain there's arson involved. This final incident was serious enough to prompt the state to finally heed the pleas of McKinney's residents and begin an investigation. Locally, a $250 reward has been offered to help solve this latest and most serious incident of somebody's idea of a Halloween prank. It's just sad that we have people like this, but they're sick. They're sick people. It really is the problem. Barry Peel, 36 Eyewitness News, McKinney. Campbell County Circuit Court Judge John Diskin says it is possible some of the defendants who settled out of court with victims of the 1977 Beverly Hills Supper Club fire might become involved in the final trial in that case. Diskin says the Richard Schilling family, owners of the Southgate Kentucky Club and Union Light Heat and Power Company, both of which settled with the victims, might re-enter the case during the final trial. They could become involved in what they want to call cross-claiming to get money from the non-settling defendants in the case. Yesterday, Diskin dropped two manufacturers as defendants in the upcoming trial against companies that made products used in the club. The final trial in the May 1977 fire, which killed 165 persons, is scheduled to begin on January 19th. Two men have been arrested in connection with the death last week of an elderly Harlan County man. Authorities say 78-year-old Henry Hamblin of Everts was killed last Friday as he walked along a road. According to state police, Hamblin was shot and beaten, and his wallet and other personal effects were taken. Marlowe and Larry Wilkerson of Everts are being held in the Harlan County Jail in connection with that slaying. The 16-day tobacco selling season begins November 23rd in Kentucky, and some tobacco specialists are confident the crop will bring the highest total profit ever. Ron Smith files this report. Tobacco specialist for the University of Kentucky College of Agriculture, Joe Smiley, estimates the 1981 Kentucky tobacco crop will total as much as 20% more than last year's crop. We would expect that this year we'll have the largest tobacco crop that we've had probably in 18 years, since 1963. Uh, the government estimate, of course, has got us at 700 and about 716 million pounds. And if this is true, we should get a large amount of income out of this year's crop. 
Smiley says factors for the bumper crop include excellent growing and curing seasons, plus there were no major problems reported due to disease. Smiley says blue mold, the disease that contaminated much of the tobacco crop in 1980, had little effect on the crop in Kentucky this year. He says blue mold damaged less than 1% of the statewide crop in 1981. Ron Smith, 36, Eyewitness News. A former director of the Kentucky Department of Agriculture's Division of Weights and Measures pled innocent yesterday to 22 counts of alleged short weighing of tobacco, falsification of official reports, and failure to report tobacco sales during 1978 and 1979. Clement Greenwell was arraigned in U.S. District Court in Catlisburg on charges stemming from a grand jury investigation of alleged tobacco fraud at the Moorhead Tobacco Warehouse. Greenwell, along with nine other men, including two of the nation's largest independent tobacco dealers, was indicted by a federal grand jury over two weeks ago, following an official's called a lengthy multi-state investigation. Greenwell allegedly took money from the Moorhead warehouseman in return for advance notice of his department's spot inspections. According to the indictment, Greenwell was involved in a scheme to systematically short weigh producers' tobacco crops during the day, and at night, the excess tobacco was removed for resale the next day. No trial date has been set in that case. I know a lot of people have been asking you today what happened to the sun, but it was so foggy this morning, how could you tell if there was any sun? Step right in the front doors. <laughs> Big guy about 6'4", grabbed me. I thought it was John Wayne, grabbed uh -huh. me, pulled me. What happened to the sun today? Well, it's clearing from the west, and Louisville now has got some sunshine, Dave. They're 60. The western part of the state up as high as 64. The sun does make a difference. That was a dense fog, a sheet of fog over uh -huh. Kentucky today, and we'll get into the why in just a moment. Right now, here are the current conditions. The temperature now out at the airport under a cloudy sky. That's the way it's been all day today, 56 degrees. The relative humidity, 64% of saturation. The barometer is rising, and the wind flows out of the northwest at 7 miles an hour. Let's focus in on Kentucky. There you see that real thin sheet-like effect that indicates that widespread fog over Kentucky today, and this was beginning at 7 a.m. this Tuesday morning. Look at it trying to push out. Really heavy. That Look, there we go. That's a good picture there. See it pushing and clearing out from the west, but the central part of the state and the eastern part of the state continue to be enshrouded by that heavy cloud cover and fog. And here's the situation. Remember the cool front that passed us very quickly last night? That set up the chilling effect. A low pressure system, which represents the remains of that system, uh, started pulling in warmer, more moist waters from the mid-Atlantic. And as those warm sheets of the moisture overran the cool air sustained on the surface, that was the ideal cooling condition with the two ingredients to cause that fog and the cloudiness, and the low is still affecting our weather right from the eastern part of the state on over to the mid-Atlantic. The western part of the state is getting into a clearing trend because this high-pressure system down in Texas, its outer influence has pierced the western edge of the state. So they're clear. 64 at Paducah, 60 at Louisville, cleared Indianapolis with 59. So it's just a matter of time until this high pressure completely clears us out. And that's reflected in the forecast. Clearing skies tonight, the overnight low about 31 to 35 degrees. High pressure will promote mostly sunny and mild conditions tomorrow. Look for a high about 58 degrees. But Thursday, a chance of showers in the forecast. Another Pacific storm. Low pressure off the Pacific Northwest with a frontal pattern. More rain in Northern California, Washington, and Oregon. And a short warm front is causing warm air to lift high into the Rockies, uh, Montana, causing a snow there. A few temperatures forecast for today. Duluth was reporting 42. 62 is in the forecast for Kansas City. Down at Dallas-Fort Worth, 76 was forecast. 74 at New Orleans, and that cool front piercing through the extreme southern part of Florida is causing rain there, and that's the reason the temperature today only reached 77 degrees. Incidentally, that eight- or nine-day-old storm last Tuesday down here off the coast of New Orleans moved all the way up the coast, still causing heavy rain and high winds in the New England area, as it has as it raked up the mid-Atlantic for the last several days. Some temperatures around the region right now. Again, clear skies, sunshine, 64 at Paducah. Louisville's got 60, 59 in clear skies at Indianapolis. The rest of the state, either partly cloudy or cloudy. Now for the forecast for Lexington and vicinity. And we have clearing tonight. Low 31, 35. Mostly sunny and mild Wednesday. High 58. Fair Wednesday night. Low 38 to 42. Partly cloudy with a chance of showers on Thursday. That's that next cool front moving in. High 62. And Dave, the forest fire level continues extremely high in the state of Kentucky. That wraps up the weather. Thank you, Frank. 
The Commonwealth Attorney for Clay, Leslie, and Jackson Counties has announced his resignation. Paul Hieronymus says he is leaving his post because some of the cases he was due to prosecute conflicted with his private practice. Hieronymus was defeated in last May's primary after 12 years in office. William Lawrence of Louisville has been elected president of the 7,700-member Kentucky Bar Association. Lawrence will begin his term on July 1st. However, he will be interim president until that time, as he is filling the vacancy created by the resignation of Henry Wilhoyt, who recently became a federal district judge. Kentucky officials will be participating in a mock disaster tomorrow at the Zimmer Nuclear Power Plant, 60 miles northeast of Lexington in Moscow, Ohio. That power plant is also a concern of environmental groups like the Sierra Club. Eyewitness News reporter Richard Green has more. Guest speaker at the club's monthly meeting was a staff member from the Cincinnati Alliance for Responsible Energy, Tom Carpenter. With a short talk and a slide presentation, Carpenter sought to inform those attending about possible problems associated with the Zimmer plant because of alleged non-compliance with regulations in its construction. We know that the plant is not being built correctly. It's being built with defective materials and it's being built uh, by drug-induced employees in uh, many cases. Uh, very sensitive components in this kind of thing. Uh, a great concern when you're building a nuclear plant. Carpenter says that Zimmer was one of the nuclear plants which underwent design and policy changes instituted at most nuclear facilities after the incident in early 1979 at Pennsylvania's Three Mile Island site. However, he claims those changes aren't enough. Design changes aren't going to solve the problems of human error. Design changes aren't going to solve the problem of equipment malfunction. In other words, we need 100% perfection in order to ensure that a nuclear accident will not wipe out an area the size of the state of Pennsylvania. As the date for the Zimmer facility's opening draws closer, those who live around it are already preparing for what could possibly happen. Northern Kentucky holds its first evacuation exercise Wednesday. Richard Green, 36, Eyewitness News. Mike, what's this about UK starting uh, quarterback running into trouble? That's right. It happened last night, and Coach Fran Kersey has had to suspend starting quarterback Tom Boyle for the final game of the season, of course, the remainder of the season. And that's what happened late this afternoon. We had word that quarterback Tom Boyle will miss Kentucky's final game because he broke team training violations, and Coach Fran Kersey had to suspend Boyle. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. First of all, Coach Fran Kersey met with that special committee which was set up to study the University of Kentucky football program. It was a lengthy meeting today. It lasted a couple of hours. This afternoon, the coach told us a little bit about his meeting today with that ad hoc committee. What kind of position do you take when you go into such a meeting like that? No other position to take except to say that what, you know, the way things are around here, the way things have been, and uh, we've had some great success, and we've made some uh, very serious mistakes by losing. So when you lose, you have meetings. Is it